Okay, so last time we ended up here, right? We started going through the nucleus. We went through a few of these slides, talked about the basic background of gene expression, went through some terminology, right? We said transcription versus translation, both related to gene expression. We went through this in probably enough detail. Went through this slide, this is basically where we stopped, right? Okay. And I said, you should know some of the specific differences between RNA and DNA. Remember, in here, spelling's important. So if you need to, practice spelling things. How many of you guys consider yourself to be good at spelling? Okay. Some of us have to practice at it. Some, some people got it from their parents, right? It's really not that fair. Um, but next step in this is kind of the genetic code. brief overview on this and I'll, I'll try to relate this the reason we're going through this is because remember last time I left you with the the thought of how vitamin D actually affects calcium absorption okay one of the things that we want to think about is if a protein is involved in a process and that protein has amino acids and that amino acid sequence is determined by a person's genes and that amino acid sequence determines the protein structure and structure determines function what I want you guys to continue to think about this quarter and next is genetics can affect a person's nutrient requirements because proteins interact with nutrients directly sometimes that interaction has to be a structure structure type interaction so when we talk about vitamin D We'll keep that in mind. So I'm saying that now. I'll give you more details coming up. That's why we're going through this. Some reason I feel that I need to justify this. Okay? But let's look at this. If we have the strands of DNA, right? We know that DNA is double-stranded. And basically, remember, we write it sometimes 5 prime to 3 prime. The other end is 5 prime to 3 prime. Basically, are there opposing strands that can bind to each other through complementary base pairing? You remember that? Well, we know that. Adenine binds to thymine, thymine, and then guanine binds to cytosine. Okay? So we know that base pairing takes place. It has direction to it. And most of the time when we write DNA, we write it this way, 5 prime to 3 prime. So I'll continue that, that pattern. And when we talk about gene expression in here, we're going to basically remember that RNA polymerase tends to go this direction. And we're going to talk about all that when we talk about gene expression in a second. Now, what that means is... We sometimes use the terms the sense strand and the anti-sense strand. The sense strand is the nucleotide sequence that is basically coding the mRNA sequence. Remember that? And the way cells do that is basically they make a complementary RNA strand to the anti-sense strand. Now by doing that, you're copying the sense strand sequence. Right? So for example, if RNA polymerase is going to read this section of DNA, what it'll do is it'll make a complementary strand to the antisense strand. And by doing that, it makes the sense strand sequence, with the exception of any place there was a T is now going to be a U, a uracil. Okay? Now, that sequence is, when it is translated from a nucleotide sequence to an amino acid sequence, remember it's read three nucleotides at a time, or three bases at a time. Remember the first codon in an mRNA is always AUG, or basically that's the first one that's translated. That's the initiator codon, and that always results in a methionine. Right? So if we read this three at a time and we look at, we use the genetic code down here, one of the points I want to make is single nucleotide changes or differences don't always result in a different amino acid. So we can say the redundancy in the genetic code is such that a single change 
in a nucleotide does not always change the amino acid in the protein. For example, let's look right here, GCU. Okay, let's say during translation, that ribosome is moving along the RNA. We'll go through this in a second. And it reads the codon GCU. Now, let's say, for example, in this particular gene, the codon that I have is GCU. The codon that all of you have is GCC. There's a single nucleotide difference between my codon and yours. My gene sequence is slightly different than yours. Is that a big deal in this case? Well, in this case, it doesn't put in a different amino acid. So the amino acid alanine is going to be in my protein and yours. So overall, we can say as far as the protein structure, no difference. Now, let's say, for example, my codon is GCU. Yours is GAU. There's a single nucleotide difference. Does it change the amino acid? In this case, it does. Okay? So in this case, I would have an alanine here in the protein. You would have... It's not aspirin. What's that stand for? Aspartic acid. Also known as aspartate. Right? Same thing. So what does that mean? Well, you know the... The thing that makes these differences, they're side chain, they're R group, right? You guys might not remember this, but the side chain, the R group of alanine is, oops, I don't do it. Oops. It's a methyl group. For alanine. Okay? What is it for aspartic acid? Well, it's an acid. It has a carboxylic acid group in its side chain. Is that a difference? Yeah. Alanine is relatively ambiguous. Not much of a characteristic here. Maybe a little bit hydrophobic, but not really. This is charged. So this is polar. So that can mean a big difference in a protein if this is a critical location in that protein structure. Single nucleotide can, can make a significant difference in a protein. Okay. So this protein structure can be altered because of that. That means in my cells, the protein that is Results from this gene might be slightly different than the structure of yours. Now, if this, this protein interacts with a nutrient, that might mean that those interactions with the nutrients are slightly different. If that nutrient is doing something like driving gene expression, it can mean that the levels of gene expression from a particular gene might be different. And that can change our metabolism, and it can also affect things like our nutrient requirements. Okay? So I'm going to give you bits and pieces of this as we go, so keep that in mind. You know all that stuff about genetics and no oh, nucleotides and the human genome project and everything it's not so much that the the bases are different as much as the effects on proteins so let's keep in mind as we go through this what's going on there so now a little bit more background in the nucleus we have just a small little segment of DNA here right and we have those double strands that are interacting and what's holding these if this is the kind of the backbone remember you've seen these before and if this is supposed to represent a base and this is another base that it's base paired with what kind of interactions are holding these together hydrogen, hydrogen bonding good that's what holds that double strand together and remember the way in mammalians it kind of has a minor groove and a major groove and it wraps around histones like that and now proteins can find specific nucleotide sequences and interact with the DNA. This particular protein has two parts to it, and it's kind of sitting in the major grooves of DNA at specific locations. 
Protein DNA interactions depend on bonds between specific amino acids of proteins and nucleotide bases. For example, let's say this protein right here has a particular amino acid that is interacting and forming hydrogen bonds with this nucleotide right here. There's two things that can alter that. If there's a different amino acid here or different nucleotide here. So the interactions between proteins and sequences of DNA are very specific. And they are also through hydrogen bonding. OK. So a change in the protein shape can alter protein DNA interactions. It's not always because of genetics. It can be because of other things as well. See the way the shape of this protein kind of lends itself to reaching in? Remember zinc fingers? Did you guys talk about any of that? Wow. Life without zinc fingers. Okay. Uh, there's parts of proteins that specifically kind of reach into parts of DNA. And sometimes this protein is first activated or inactivated by other molecules and that can alter the protein shape so it can actually reach in there or it can't so we'll talk about that for example some proteins rely on nutrients to change their structure or shape and that allows them to bind DNA so imagine this protein here that if a specific nutrient is lacking the shape of the protein is in a is has a structure it can interact with DNA okay So a little bit more background, and then I'm going to give you specifics of this little inset right here. <clears throat> Up here at the top, kind of a simplified version of DNA. So here's a little strand that is supposed to show a mammalian gene. So this is kind of a gene map, or sometimes you'll call, call it a cartoon of a gene, right? Double strand of DNA, a little bit of nomenclature here. This little arrow right here, if this is an exon, what does this little plus one in the arrow mean? You heard this before? When we express a gene, what are we doing? Transcription. This is an easy one. You guys are going to go, oh. Transcription start site. Never heard that before. Okay. This little plus one is transcription start site. In other words, that's where the RNA transcription starts. That's the first nucleotide that ends up in the RNA. So in the lab, for example, this is not, not as big a deal as it used to be, but back in the day when I was in the lab more, what we used to try to do is get sequences in gene bank. Man, when you did that, you were pretty cool. Boom, submit a sequence of gene bank. And so when we would do that, one of the things is you would clone a piece of DNA and you'd start sequencing it. If it's part of a gene, what are you looking for? You're looking for transcription start site. Why? Because you know upstream of that is a promoter region. Okay? So we have, for example, transcription start site here. Upstream of that is the promoter. So this is promoter region through here. Have you heard that term? We talked about that last time. More specifically, sometimes you call it the proximal promoter. They have a promoter proximal element. What do we say the promoter is? Is it a noun or an adjective or a verb? <coughs> we said it's a noun. So the promoter is a relatively short segment of DNA that promotes or regulates the expression of a gene. So the promoter is a segment or portion of DNA that promotes or regulates the expression of a gene. What does that mean? Regulates transcription. <clears throat> 
Okay, if we look at some of the other things that are there, say a yellow box right there, that minus 30 means that's relative to the transcription start site. That's approximately 30 nucleotides upstream. And why do we say upstream? Because when we write DNA like this, have you guys drawn these out before in any classes? When you draw out a, D, a piece of DNA like that, basically we have two strands. The top strand is the 5 prime to 3 prime. So anything 5 prime is upstream. So generally when we write this, we're assuming transcription is going to occur this way, left to right. So this is upstream. Okay? Minus 30 is shown right there. So I'm going to draw some of this out. Let's say here's my plus one, here's my minus 30. Have you heard of this? Hopefully you yeah. have. Tata box. What does that mean? Why do they call it Tata? Because it's generally a repeating sequence of TATA. -T -A. And there's usually about eight or ten nucleotides that have a specific TATA -TA type sequence. So we're going to say the TATA box is a nucleotide sequence that's found in approximately. Approximately half of mammalian genes. Maybe a little more. We're going to say half. It's a common nucleotide sequence that's part of the promoter of mammalian genes. We'll tell you why it's there in a second. So far, so good? Yep. So it's kind of a function of the promoter? Yeah, exactly. Last time I said, this is where we're going with this. Last time I said, wow, all these billions of nucleotides, some chromosomes are millions of nucleotides and bases long. How do cells know where the genes are? Well, proteins recognize specific nucleotide sequences. If you're going to name a protein that binds to the Tata box, what would you name that protein? Pretty close. This is ingenious. The Tata binding protein. Right? That's stuff you just can't make up. Okay? So what happens is this protein that binds that is called the Tata binding protein. Right? Has a structure that's looking for specific nucleotide sequences. In this case, it's that TATA -T repeat. Now, what are these other things, these like brown or orange rectangles? These are promoter elements. Um, a better name for this, I would say, is these are regulatory elements. Uh, we're going to say, how about this? Um, so is that proximal promoters? I don't want it like negative. Yeah, the proximal promoters are usually a few hundred nucleotides long. You know, they're a lot of times 500 to 1,000. That's kind of what you're looking for. What's an element? I'll say phosphorus or calcium or something. What's an element in this case? Have you heard that before? Yeah, in this case, we're going to say an element is a uh, short sequence of nucleotides. In this case, it's DNA, but it can be RNA. So a short sequence of nucleotides. Okay, so we have these elements. Come back to that in a second. Um, remember here we have exons. Here's an exon, here's an intron, exon, intron. This is a little bit different. We're going to, for now, 
we're going to ignore these kind of green regions. Those are enhancer regions. They affect gene expression in some ways. We're going to, we're going to blow past that right now. Okay? Now, remember when we, we have exons and introns, remember the difference? What's an exon? They are expressed. Exons actually are expressed in the amino acid sequence of the protein. Introns are not. Yep. So we'll talk about that in a second, but that's what that means. Okay, let's get a little bit closer to gene expression. Now, what's going on here? I'm going to tell you in a minute a sequence of events that occurs in order for a gene to be expressed. This is all review. Okay. So, uh, got quiet. Um, these elements have a sequence that allows a specific protein to bind to them. Okay? <clears throat> so let me tell you what happens. And we'll go through the sequence. Oh, let me go through this first. This is in the next slide. This is from a biochemistry text. This is not from yours. I'm not going to ask you specific names of these factors. And when I say factor in here, most of the time I'm talking about protein. So when I say a transcription factor, what is that protein involved in? Transcription. So that's a generic term you want to be very familiar with, and that's all it is. Transcription factor is a protein that is involved in transcription, in the transcription process. So let's look at this. Here we have, for example, a sequence of DNA, the TATA box. In the first step of this, we have TATA binding protein that's recognizing TATA box, binding to it. Okay? That initiates other transcription factors to binding to this DNA. Okay? So you don't have to write this down yet, but let's go through this. So, for example, transcription factor 2B comes in, binds TATA binding protein and DNA. And now, in this case, and this is really simplified, a few other proteins are binding to the DNA. They eventually recruit pole 2. What's that stand for? Polymerase. What's the name in front of that? RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase 2 is the enzyme in mammalians that makes RNA that is translated. Okay? So more on that in a second. So now what happens is RNA polymerase comes in, a few more proteins, transcription factors basically join the party, the transcription party. Everybody assembles, and then towards the end of this slide, RNA polymerase takes off, starts going through the gene, synthesizing an RNA molecule, melting the DNA as it does, incorporating the correct nucleotides in order to make that RNA. And where's all this occurring in the cell? Nucleus. Okay? So a good habit in this class is look at the detail and stand back and think, okay, what's, what's the big picture? So we're doing gene transcription in the nucleus of a cell. What kind of cell? Could be almost any cell that can do transcription. Okay? So now let's look at this. I have a question. Uh-huh. Part of it has to do when cells divide, right? They split their nucleus, and when they initially do that, they don't necessarily bring mitochondria along for the ride. So when they make a new cell, they'll synthesize new mitochondria. So part of it has to do with cell division. Let's look at this. The motor region. Here's our gene sequence. This is the assembly of transcription factors on the promoter region. So each one of those little circles represents a different transcription factor. And then RNA polymerase comes in, and then transcription occurs. Okay, so let's go through and we'll let's specifically describe the steps in this process. Okay, step one in transcription. Is typically, so step one. TATA binding protein binds the TATA box. 
Tata binding protein facilitates or helps recruit other transcription factors. In addition, some transcription factors bind to the promoter without the assistance of TATA binding protein. So some transcription factors can bind the promoter without the assistance of TATA binding protein. Some of the transcription factors bind directly to DNA while others bind other transcription factors. In general, approximately 25 to 50 general transcription factors are required for gene expression. Approximately 25 to 50 general transcription factors are required for gene expression. And again, I'm just talking mammalian systems, I'm not talking plants or anything else. Okay? That transcription factor complex recruits RNA polymerase to the transcription start site. The transcription factor complex, which means all those proteins together, help recruit RNA polymerase to the transcription start site. The proteins are required because RNA polymerase 2 does not recognize specific nucleotide sequences. It does not recognize specific nucleotide sequences. In other words, RNA polymerase can't really find the promoter by itself. So other proteins interact with RNA polymerase, recruit it to the proper location, once RNA polymerase is at the transcription start site, it can be released by the protein factors, almost all of them. We're going to simplify it. Once RNA polymerase attaches to DNA at transcription start site, it can transcribe through the gene. And that little movie that I put online is kind of cool because it shows. That's what that's actually showing. It shows RNA polymerase running through a double-stranded DNA. The, the, it's melting it as it goes through it, and it's incorporating nucleotides in order to make that RNA, and then the RNA is coming out of the top of it. Okay, so if you watch that, that's what that's showing. That's transcription. You'll see the proteins start to assemble. Here comes polymerase. Then there's kind of a releasing factor that comes in, allows RNA polymerase to run through that gene. It starts running through it unbelievably fast. Okay. The one we're talking about in this is RNA polymerase 2. Okay. Yeah. Are you correct to say that RNA polymerase doesn't use the protein to find the... It does. In a lot of genes, it does. It's dependent upon TATA binding protein. It doesn't need a specific nucleotide sequence. Okay. Yeah. The reason is, is because these other proteins, so if we look at this... These other proteins are helping RNA polymerase get right here. 
Now in prokaryotes, it's different. In prokaryotes, RNA polymerase recognizes nucleotide sequences, but in, in mammalian systems, it doesn't. So it's relying on these other proteins. And I said before, these other proteins, we're going to call them general transcription factors. So this is the general transcription complex that's required here. Uh-huh. You said that just a few, like, uh, don't, like, have to bind or don't need the, uh, the title box to uh, bind the transcription factors. Like, some just kind of go there, and then all the rest of them come along once the title box is there. Yeah, it's kind of a combination. So... There's a sequence of events here that, is, that um, allows some of the proteins to bind, and then once they bind, other proteins sometimes are going to form bridges between some of the proteins. Sometimes they're going to have a protein that helps them come in, and then they bind nucleotides. There's kind of a sequence of events that occurs here. And when you do these experiments, you can actually figure out which of these are binding to the DNA and which of them are binding other proteins. And as part of this is called slang as you call promoter bashing where you're trying to characterize where the elements are and what's binding to them and a lot of these transcription factors are used on lots of different genes so you see the same proteins kind of over and over again for general transcription okay so then RNA polymerase runs through this and we end up with an RNA sorry RNA Not yet. It's RNA. It's nuclear RNA. Includes that one as well. Yep. That's a transcription factor. Tata binding protein. Pretty general. Is that okay? Okay, so you want to be able to explain that. Now, we went through this. I'm not going to go through that again, I don't think. Okay, RNA's made, transcribed. And you guys remember this, and remember this is the nucleus, NC nucleus. <coughs> okay. Once that RNA is made, it goes through various processes. One of the processes that it goes through is splicing. Okay, remember this? Here's the gene, exons, introns, shown here. Following transcription, we have nuclear RNA. In other words, all these introns and exons that are here were all transcribed. All of their nucleotides end up in the RNA. Okay? Those nucleotides have specific sequences that are recognized as, as splice sites. Remember that? Spliceosomes or any of that stuff you might have talked about? If not, here we go. Uh, so in the nucleus, there are proteins that are actually recognizing where the introns are, and they're removing them. So the introns are removed, and we end up with mRNA still in the nucleus. So splicing is a type of RNA processing that occurs in the nucleus. We ready for translation? Not yet, because this is going to go into the cytosol for translation to start. All right, we know mRNA is messenger RNA, right? 
So far so good. Let's go a little bit farther. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back to this and I'm going to talk to you about regulation of gene expression. That's where it's going to get more, I'd say, interesting. So far review. Let's go a few more minutes and we'll take a break. Okay? Translation really quickly. So we went through the first part of this. We said transcription occurs in the nucleus. We have an RNA molecule. It says mature. So basically what they're trying to say is an mRNA molecule goes through the nuclear pores into the cytosol where translation starts. Remember, mRNA is a single-stranded molecule. It binds to, remember this sequence? So in the cytosol, mRNA binds to the small subunit of a ribosome. Remember that? And this is in the cytosol. So if this is mRNA, small subunit binds, and then what? Initiating codon. For RNA, sorry, ribosomal RNA, sorry, tRNA. That's all the kinds of RNA there is, so I finally got it. All right? Then what happens? Large subunit, and then? Oops. More tRNAs come in. So that's what's happening here. The ribosome assembles tRNAs are incorporated so that the codon matches the anticodon. So the appropriate amino acid is incorporated. Remember that? Ribosome basically pulls the mRNA through. And as these tRNAs are next to each other, the ribosome has an enzyme that links the amino acids through peptide bonds. So we have formation of a protein or a peptide. So the ribosome has that enzyme? Yeah. Let me ask you this. What are ribosomes made out of? Protein. So that was right. <laughs> protein, because it's an enzyme. What else? Ribosomal RNA, right? So ribosomes are a combination of RNA and protein. There are these elaborate, I'd say, there are elaborate structures that basically allow this to happen. If you've ever seen like three-dimensional stuff of this, the ribosome has a specific shape so the tRNAs can come in, match the codon anticodon, if it's not the right one, the ribosome ejects it basically until it gets the right one in there. Once it gets in there, there's an enzyme that's part of that ribosome structure, links the peptide. Now you have an empty tRNA, it's basically expulsed from the ribosome, and the ribosome slides. It pulls the mRNA through, so it goes to the next codon. Unbelievably fast. If you're doing translation kind of stuff in the lab, it's amazing how fast new proteins can be made through that kind of weird, elaborate process, right? So this is going to continue until all the way in. The ribosome will go all the way to a specific codon known as the stop, stop codon. And that's where translation stops. The whole thing falls apart. Ribosomal RNA. Another way of looking at this. All right, this is from 210. This is, I'll let you guys read through this. But read through this if you want. There's also, of course, a lot of stuff on, online if you want to look at the basics of translation. I used to have a link in here for basic kind of molecular biology, including translation. I don't think any students were looking at it, so I took it out of there. But you can find lots of stuff on this. So review that. You want to be, be able to describe to me the basics of translation kind of just in the level of detail that I went through. I think you probably talk about that in biochemistry and probably 161, right? Bio 161? Okay. A little bit more, then we'll backtrack. We went through this, I think, DNA to RNA, protein. A classic example, you remember sickle cell? where that single nucleotide difference causes a change in the structure of uh, hemoglobin, 
And in this case, the hemoglobin molecules actually stick together. They form these uh, kind of weird adducts where the hemoglobin actually sticks together, forms these kind of long chains of hemoglobin. It becomes dysfunctional, doesn't transport oxygen, but it also alters the structure of the red blood cells. So they get this kind of sickle shape where they actually, they're no longer flexible, so they get hung up in the very small blood vessels, and they'll hang up and cause some of the symptoms of sickle cell anemia, for example. Now here's where we're going to go in one second. Man, I have a typo on here. DNA to RNA to protein, and I said before, nutrients can affect, what should that be? That's an A, man. That is an A. Affect a gene's expression. They can either increase or decrease a protein being made. Vitamin D, for example, increases the expression of a protein that is needed for the absorption of calcium. We're going to look at that next. Let's take our break right here, and then we'll pick this up. Uh, I think it's on. Okay, let's talk about this, how vitamin D actually affects gene expression. Let's talk about this part of the diagram. I don't know why I did that. This right here. This little inset right here. And uh, let me, let's go through some nomenclature. This right here, VDR equals vitamin D receptor. VDR equals vitamin D receptor. <coughs> D3 is basically activated vitamin D. RXR. Here's a good one. Retinoid. You hear retinoid, what do you think of? Vitamin A. And the nerdy part of this story is when they first cloned this protein, they didn't know what it bound to, so they said it binds ligand X. It's called it retinoid X. They weren't sure which type of retinoid it actually bound to. Um, now, what else is here? Oh, VDRE. VDRE equals vitamin D responsive element. Okay, let's go through this. <clears throat> In this inset, what's happening is this part of the diagram is in the nucleus. Okay, so what happens is vitamin D enters the nucleus. And then binds VDR. Vitamin D enters the nucleus and then binds VDR. See this last bullet point? Some transcription factors require nutrients to bind to DNA. Transcription factors that bind nutrients are called nuclear receptors. So VDR <coughs> is a nuclear receptor. So where is it? It's in the nucleus. So VDR is in the nucleus. When vitamin D enters a cell, it binds VDR. And now if we look at this diagram, what's it trying to show? Well, here's the shape of VDR before it binds vitamin D. Here's its shape after it binds vitamin D. See the way that's different? So when vitamin D binds VDR, it causes a conformational change. In other words, a structure change in VDR. VDR then binds RXR. <clears throat> 
VDR is phosphorylated. Remember that? What does that mean? Phosphates are added. VDR is phosphorylated and then binds VDRE. So what is VDRE? Well, it's a response element. So it's an element, so we define that as a nucleotide sequence. Right? We said an element is a segment of nucleotides. In this case, see this little sequence right here? These nucleotides represent a typical vitamin D responsive element. In other words, that's what VDR is looking for. It's looking for this nucleotide sequence or something really similar. So VDR binds VDRE. VDR only binds VDRE. Okay. VDRE. That's where we're going. <laughs> so let's add this. Here's VDRE. Here's our VDR complex that's now bound to vitamin D responsive element. Okay? The binding of VDR to VDRE can help or can affect transcription factor recruitment. The binding of VDR to VDRE can affect transcription factor recruitment. And consequently, regulate transcription. Of what? A specific gene. Okay, let's take a step back. When you think about vitamin D, what do you think about some of its functions? It's most famous for it. <coughs> Regulates calcium, right? Calcium. So, not all genes have VDREs. But genes that are regulated by vitamin D tend to have a VDRE. There's a lot of alphabet soup, right? And that just makes sense. So even if you're not writing this, just that makes sense, right? So in other words, if I have a gene that needs to be regulated by vitamin D levels in the body, put VDRE in that promoter region of that gene. And now, as vitamin D becomes available, it can affect gene expression of that particular gene. Let's say I have a gene that has nothing to do with calcium, does not need to be regulated by vitamin D. No reason for VDRE to be in that promoter region. Okay? So when you start scanning the genome and the sequence of DNA, if let's say, for example, I clone a gene and I'm sequencing that promoter region, if I find VDRE, what does that tell me? It's probably involved in, in maybe calcium metabolism, or basically it needs to be regulated by vitamin D. Okay, so when you start searching this, that's one of the first things that they notice. Now I won't go into the history of all of this, but I was there at some of the first seminars. I was there at first seminars when they started figuring this stuff out. And basically what they found out was if we, found a, if we have a particular gene and we, we grow cells in our lab and now we take those cells 
and we measure the amount of RNA that's made from a specific gene, and we quantify that. Now we had to activate a vitamin D to that. What they found was that vitamin D responsive element, if they put that in front of a gene or if they found it in front of a gene, it was drastically affected by the level of vitamin D. So what did they call it? Wow, that thing responds to vitamin D. Let's call it the vitamin D responsive element. Okay? So here's why it's important. Let's say, for example, we have VDR there, and now what can it do? Now VDR is there. Now maybe it allows another protein to bind to that, and now we can basically enhance the transcription factor assembly. Okay? So we call these general transcription factors, right? VDRE is an example of a regulatory <coughs> transcription factor. It's a regulatory transcription factor. VDR. VDR is the transcription factor. Now what does that mean? Here's my example. Let's say, for example, Let's say vitamin D is there, and I'm just going to give you some numbers. Let's say, for example, if I add vitamin D to this particular plate, I notice that transcription goes up, and now, for example, I make 10 mRNA molecules per minute. Okay. Now, let's say vitamin D levels are low. Vitamin D doesn't bind VDR. We don't get this. Transcription significantly lower. In a lot of cases, VDR enhances gene expression. In some cases, it's just the opposite, where it'll actually go down. So in that case, for example, the VDR is actually a kind of a repressor protein. It's repressing transcription factor. The example that I want to go through right now, though, is enhancement of transcription. Here's the first of many drawings of an intestinal cell. Brush border membrane. So what's here? <coughs> In, we're going to say inside, yeah, lumen of the small intestine. So we're going to say small intestine, sorry, you can't see this. What's over here? The blood. Specifically, portal vein. Okay, here's calcium. Say we consume calcium. Calcium goes through a transporter. In the breast border membrane, enters the enterocyte. In the cytosol of the intestinal cell, binds a protein called calcium is binding it, so they came up with the term calbindin. Calbindin is the protein that moves calcium. So calbindin is a protein that moves calcium through the cytosol. of enterocytes and helps its absorption. And when I say absorption in here, what does that mean? That means into the blood. It doesn't mean it's something just got into the intestinal cell. If we say that something is absorbed in here, we're going to mean it's bioavailable, which basically mean it's assimilated into tissues. So what does calbindin do? It's a protein. Binds calcium, 
moves it through intestinal cells so that it goes to the other membrane, and this is called, remember this from anywhere? Basolateral membrane. That's what I'm going to refer it as. Basolateral membrane. Calcium goes through another transporter, goes into the blood. So in general, what does that mean? more calbindin you have, the more efficiently calcium is absorbed. The more calbindin that's in intestinal cells, the higher the efficiency of calcium absorption. So now let's go back to this cartoon and add some players. Okay. Let's go back to this, and we said before, we didn't really name this before. Now, what do you think vitamin D does to calbindin levels? <coughs> Increases it. How does it do that? Just like what we described. So let's say, for example, here is BDR. Here's vitamin D bound to it. Here's RXR. This is phosphorylated. This helps us symbol more transcription factors. That helps recruit RNA polymerase. And in this case, we can call this the calbindin gene. Pretty simple. Why do they put vitamin D in milk? These calciums, you know, milk is a good source of calcium, so you might as well put vitamin D in something that's a good source of calcium, right? So what happens? You consume the milk, the vitamin D that's in there, right? Most milk in the U.S. is fortified with vitamin D. The vitamin D goes into your blood, is activated, and then what does it do? The vitamin D eventually, we drew it like this before, goes into these intestinal cells, into the nucleus, binds BDR, affects expression, transcription, sorry, of the calbindin gene. The mRNA goes into the cytosol, translated to make calbindin, and now calbindin is there to improve calcium absorption. Make sense? Good there. We're going to use that kind of process over and over again. Later on in the quarter, I'm going to say zinc regulates gene expression, and this is how. 329, I'm going to say this is how it regulates gene expression. So the thing to keep in mind is what happened here. There is a transcription factor called the nuclear receptor that binds the nutrient. That nutrient is affecting the shape of that protein and allowing it to bind DNA. That happens over and over again. Nutrients don't bind DNA. They bind proteins that then can bind DNA. Okay? Mm -hmm. What is NC? Nucleus. Oh. Good there? Let's look and find out how other proteins are kind of made. So now we're going to kind of move away from this. We'll come back to that later on a few cases. Let's pick up the secretory pathway of a protein. Okay? So that hopefully is recorded. If you have questions on that stuff, let me know. Now here's a process that I think is unique. I don't think you went through this in other classes, and this amazes me. Because you go through translation a couple times, but no one tells you that some proteins actually leave cells. They say, protein is made and the cytosol is translated, there you go. When actually probably two-thirds of proteins that are made in a cell actually don't stay in the cytosol. So that's what we're going to talk about now. This says not all newly synthesized proteins actually remain and function in the cytosol. For example, some proteins need to be transported to the nucleus, the mitochondria, or the lysosome, 
while others are actually secreted from a cell. For example, livers make a protein called albumin. Have you ever heard of that? It's one of the most common proteins in your blood. It has a variety of functions. It's made in liver cells, and then liver cells put it into the blood. That's one of them, a type of albumin, yeah. The secretory pathway of proteins begins as a protein is targeted to the ER for co-translational insertion into the inside of the ER. After translation, segments of the ER actually bud off and translocate to the Golgi for further processing and preparation for export. That doesn't make any sense. Let's go through that in one second. We're going to follow up on that. So a little bit more about kind of cell biology. Remember the ER? Well, we have, here's the nucleus, and there's portions of the, especially the RER, that is associated really kind of around the nucleus. Remember the difference between rough frindoplasmic reticulum and smooth? Ribosomes. What are the ribosomes doing there? Translation. Why are they there? I thought translation occurred in the cytosol. Yeah. Some proteins are actually made by ribosomes, and they're immediately inserted into the RER. So that's where we're going with this. So the ER is a network of membranous channels in the cytoplast or cytosol that kind of links the nucleus, Golgi, and plasma membrane. So it's an intracellular organelle. It's important for the synthesis of membrane lipids and proteins. The RER has ribosomes. It's more abundant in cells with high protein synthesis, for example. The RER is. It's the location of most cellular protein synthesis. So most cellular proteins go through the process that we're going to talk about right now. Most secretory proteins are those destined for other organelles. So they'll act, some of them leave the cell. Some proteins actually go to other parts of the cell. And we'll describe all of that. This is a really important graphic, so we want to be able to go through step by step. Now, when I reviewed this textbook, the last couple editions, when I sent in my comments, I said, whatever you do, don't get rid of that. And they got rid of that. So that's where I am on the priority list, right? This is really important, so we're going to go through this. So even if you don't see it in your text, you're going to remember details of this. Okay? So let's kind of orient where we are. Phospholipid bilayer of the RER. Cytosol inside of the RER. So if you want, you can kind of imagine this going around and, and forming an enclosed structure. We're going to work left to right. Let me go through this really quick, and then I'll slow down and go through in more detail. Here's the mRNA, this strand right here. Now, they're doing this for, you know, kind of the artwork and trying to explain it. They're showing one mRNA molecule. This actually goes through in steps. I wish they would have separated it, but they didn't. We can kind of break it into steps, A, B, C, D, going left to right. This little snowman is what? That's a ribosome. What's this? That's a protein that's being translated. So this is a peptide. Let's define these right now. SRP equals signal recognition protein. Signal recognition protein. SP, signal peptide. SP equals signal peptide. DP, docking protein. That's all the alphabet soup we have to do for now. Uh, let's look at this real quick. As a protein is synthesized, it's inserted into the RER. 
So keep that in mind. Now, this is the case for lots of proteins, but remember, some proteins are actually translated by free ribosomes in the cytosol. So here we go. Kind of in step one, translation starts. <coughs> and a peptide uh, exits the ribosome. Uh, uh, I should say, a peptide, what's the word? protrudes from the top of the ribosome. So in step one, translation starts, and a peptide protrudes. How about extends? That sounds better, huh? Extends from the top of the ribosome. The first 25 to 35 amino acids comprise the signal peptide. So what that means is, and I'll erase this in a second, if we're doing synthesis, and this is kind of upside down, isn't it? This is our mRNA. And this is the peptide that's coming out. This is the signal peptide. That's on the amino terminus. 25 to 35 amino acids long. The signal peptide is a specific amino acid sequence that targets proteins to the secretory pathway. Signal peptide is a specific amino acid sequence that targets proteins to the secretory pathway. Signal peptide is bound by SRP. That's what's happened right here. Signal peptide comes out. SRP recognizes that, binds to it. SRP moves the translation complex to the surface of the RER. So SRP moves the translation complex to the surface of the RER. The signal peptide is inserted through a channel protein towards the lumen of the RER. SRP is released. and can be reused. So what does it do? Looks for another signal peptide. So SRP is released. It did its job and can be reused. Yeah, translation starts in the cytosol. If the protein has a signal peptide, SRP is there to recognize it and realizes this complex needs to move. SRP works with other proteins, takes it to the surface of the RER. Docking protein stabilizes the ribosome to the channel protein. Right? That name makes sense. Docking protein stabilizes the ribosome to a channel protein for translation. Docking protein stabilizes the ribosome to the channel protein in the RER membrane. That's this guy right here. <coughs> 
So here's a term. Co-translational insertion occurs. Co-translational insertion occurs. So what does that mean? As translation continues, the protein's inserted into the RER. So co-translational insertion occurs. as the protein enters the RER. Make sense? So now our protein translation has started. Cell recognizes, oh, this protein needs to go through the secretory pathway. SRP moves it here. The peptide is, goes through the channel protein. Docking protein now stabilizes the ribosome. Translation continues. Now the protein's going into the RER. Where's the ribosome? Still in the cytosol. Where's the mRNA? In the cytosol. Where's the protein going? Into the RER. Okay. Now, inside the RER, SPA, guess what that stands for? signal peptidase cleaves the signal peptide. So in the RER, signal peptidase cleaves the signal peptide. So it's removed. Is that okay? Yeah, it performed its function. Move translation complex to the RER its job is done, it's removed from the protein. So signal peptidase cleaves signal peptide. Translation continues until the stop codon. So here we have continual translation till the stop codon, then what happens? We said before, once a ribosome hits that stop codon, disassembles. Translation continues until the stop codon. When the ribosome disassembles and the completed protein is in the RER. Got it? So now what happened? We started translation in the cytosol. Cell recognized this protein that you're making needs to go through the secretory pathway. I'll tell you why in a second. Now, if you think about what we said a few minutes ago, would all proteins have a signal peptide? No. Only the proteins that have to go through the secretory pathway have this signal peptide. Let's say I have two different proteins, protein A and protein B. They both have different functions, but they both have to go through the secretory pathway. Could the cell use the same signal peptide for both of them? Yeah, it's kind of a generic sequence. You can put it in 100 different proteins in front of 100 different proteins. Every protein could have a different function. The function of the signal peptide is to start them through the secretory pathway. So you can use that same signal peptide sequence in different proteins because it's cleaved anyway. It's not going to affect the final protein function. Okay, So if I'm looking at a gene sequence and I see that in this first part of the transcript or gene, I can actually see, eventually determine that amino acid sequence. And I have software that can detect whether or not that's a signal peptide sequence. If I see that, what does that mean? Well, whatever protein I'm trying to characterize, I know it goes through the secretory pathway. Okay? Now, let's say, for example, in recombinant DNA technology, I can actually go in the lab, and if I'm working with proteins, I can take a protein, I can put that signal peptide in front of the protein. Where does the protein go? It'll go through the ER, even though it's not supposed to. 
So cells use these signaling peptides basically to move proteins around. And there's several of these, and I'm not going to muddy the water anymore of that, but this secretory pathway is extremely common. It requires these mechanisms for it to occur. And now what happens is once we get through the RER, let's kind of follow this protein. Now, if we look at this slide, this is what we were talking about, for example, right? This ribosome is bound to the RER. Why? Because it's translating a protein and it's inserting the protein in here. Now what can the cell do? Now the cell can take this part of the RER, close a piece of it off, and then move this through the cell. Okay? Typically what happens now is, or a lot of times what happens is, this part of the RER is then moved to the Golgi. So let's kind of keep following this guy. Here's the Golgi. Uh-huh. So basically you just said that the rough endoplasmic reticulum like encloses the immune translator proteins and moves from them. Yeah. Parts of it butt off. Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool because what will happen is proteins will wrap around parts of the RER, surround it, pinch it off. All of its contents are in there. Then those proteins will move it to another part of the cell. It contains its contents, and now it can go to whatever part of the cell it needs to. Uh huh. And that would be like the transport. Yes. Yep. Commonly, the next stop for the RER is the Golgi apparatus, and the Golgi has symmetry to it. In other words, it's asymmetrical. It has direction. The cis means same or close, right? Cis is typically the part of the Golgi that's closest to the RER. Trans means the part of the Golgi closest to the plasma membrane. So if you think about what's happening, see this is in incoming transport vesicle. This could be a part of the RER. The cell can basically just push these together and they'll kind of meld together. They're both lipid bilayers. So what happens is if you have two closed compartment cysts and they come together, those plasma membranes will kind of fuse and now the contents mix. So now what happens? Now we're inside what's called the Golgi. And the reason that's important is now we have different functions that will take place. And when you think about Golgi in here, I want you to remember this over and over again. For us, the most important function of the Golgi is glycosylation. What does that mean? Sugar. Adding carbohydrates. So for us, the most relevant function of the Golgi <coughs> is glycosylating proteins. Yeah. Glycosylating? Yeah. I'm going to say glycosylation the addition of carbohydrate. In this case, it's to a protein. Okay? So now what happens is kind of similar to what happened in the RER. If, for example, these are proteins coming from the RER and then they fuse with the Golgi, the Golgi tends to move proteins from cis to trans. And as it does that, it's kind of budding off pieces and moving them along the Golgi, and as it's doing that, the protein's being processed. And one of the processes is glycosylation. Uh -huh. So is the Golgi like made up of budded pieces of the RER? Basically? Not always, but it's kind of kind of distinct and then parts of that mix. Yeah. The cell will actually send, you know, Golgi glycosylation enzymes to the Golgi. And then they're basically in there, and then they, they mix with the RER that's coming in. Okay, so this constitutes the next step of protein sorting and trafficking uh, for secretory proteins after the, R, after the, this should probably say RER. Uh huh. What do you mean you say the protein is being processed? Like it's pulled? It was already been translated? Yeah. Okay, so it's being translated. Already translated. Protein processing can mean things like folding, glycosylation, maybe acetylation.
different things that eventually cause that protein to have its correct structure to function. So sometimes carbohydrates are required for that. Mm -hmm. The addition of carbohydrate. So this is more detail about the Golgi. It consists of membrane enclosed flattened vesicles. Proteins move through the Golgi in a stepwise fashion. I went through that. Cis Golgi accepts newly synthesized proteins from the RER. Trans is the exit site from the Golgi. And we went through this. Glycosylation is a major function. Polysaccharides are added to proteins, making glycoproteins. Then they're often inserted into membranes. That's one example. It's responsible, along with the ER, for synthesizing membrane organelles and also the plasma membrane. ER and the Golgi comprise the secretory pathway of proteins. Let's look at kind of big picture, and this will hopefully bring everything together. Let's say here's the nucleus. Say translation starts in the cytosol, moves to the surface of the RER. Protein ends up in the RER. Pieces bud off from the RER fused with the Golgi, they remember this is the cis side, and then the protein is processed. Now lots of proteins go through this. So I'm going to give you three examples of proteins that go through this process. In this case, this protein in pathway 1 is being exocytosed from this cell. Example here would be albumin from liver cells. Pathway 2 is this is a integral membrane protein. This protein is going to remain in the membrane. What's an example of an integral membrane protein we talked about? Yeah, it could be a channel protein. How about GLUT? Remember GLUT? Glucose transporter embedded in the plasma membrane. So a good example here would be, we could say GLUT, or how about insulin receptor? That's how it gets there, goes through the secretory pathway. So secretory pathway doesn't always mean the protein is completely secreted. In this case it does, in this case it means it's in the membrane. Look at pathway three. In this case, Proteins are being targeted to the lysosome. So in pathway 3, an example would be lysosomal enzymes. So if you think about it, how do those proteins, those enzymes, get to the lysosome? Secretory pathway. The cell starts translating them, recognizes them as secretory pathway. They go through the RER, the Golgi, and then parts of the Golgi fuse with the lysosome, so the lysosomal enzymes end up in the lysosome. That's how they get there. Uh -huh. So for pathway 3, like the only reason why those proteins wouldn't have just been synthesized in the cytosol in the first place was because they needed like more processing in the Golgi, like with acetylation or something. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of it, yeah. So appropriate processing can occur. Is the cell um, selected in those proteins, or is it just like... Still in general, it knows exactly where those proteins are supposed to go. Yeah. So protein trafficking, this is called, like moving in a particular, it's very specific overall. Yeah. Yep. So there is processing that occurs, just to clarify, like in the Golgi, it's not like in the smoothie or? Golgi does it as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, can do both. That, like Golgi was mainly just like the packaging and stuff, but it does do a little bit of processing. Though. Yep. Yeah. Good? I think so. Okay. Okay, let me... Um